Ryan Grimm joins me. He's the author of We've Got People. Uh, it's a new book out. It's about progressives versus the establishment, but not just now, but historically. And you can get it at shoptyt.com. Ryan is the Washington Bureau Chief of The Intercept and um, one of the best reporters and editors there is in the country. No. Okay. And I'm not playing. Look, I, look, he's also a Young Turks contributor, so let me be honest about that. Uh, but uh, we want to be upfront about it. But I, there's a lot of Young Turks contributors. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, putting the uh, fun aside, uh, let's get to it. So, the book is about the progressive movement versus the establishment. I thought this just happened the other day. Uh, what is all this history about you got, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one reason I wanted to write it uh, because there are plenty of people who. Kind of almost think that, or or they know somehow that that's not the case, but they don't know where to find the the actual history. And it turns out there wasn't really anywhere precisely to find it. There are some good books about the left. Listen, liberal, it's a good one. That kind of stuff, but nobody has been both kind of on the left and and like and caring about what the left cares about, and also reporting on Washington on a day to day basis. Um, you have people like Dave Dayan who do that, but he's based here in LA. Um, so I, I had this unique kind of vantage point to, to watch this all unfold over the last 12 years or so. I really started covering it in the 2006 midterms. Um, and w when Bernie Sanders took off in 2015, I started thinking like, you know, there, there, there should be something for people who are just starting to tune into politics to let them know what's happened before so that they know what mistakes have been made and what worked, uh, you know, what fights have been waged, who the, who the good guys are and the bad guys are, or, or even if they switch roles at different times. Then when Trump won and you had all of these people turn from casual observers of politics to hardcore activists, um, I, I thought, okay, now they, they too need this. Uh, this history lesson. Then when Ocasio Cortez won, it showed that like the Bernie Sanders phenomenon was not just one off, which you knew, like, and, and people knew, but it was that, that this was a this was a movement, a people powered movement that you know had a long way to go, but there was a, a lot had come before, it, and it was time to just look, put get get that down for people so they they have a sense of of where they've been. They come so, from. So, Ryan, I'm going to go even further in the past uh, to just to get to the point where you start talking about Jesse Jackson. Uh, and so, and there's a lot I learned about that that I didn't know. But let me go further back. So, mm -hmm. they, there's this mythology in America that uh, progressives can't, are weak, they can't unite, and it is by definition, it's like herding cats. People will say mm -hmm. it over and over again. But wait a minute, FDR was a progressive and he wasn't weak. He was yeah. uh, arguably too strong, wanting <laughs> to pack the courts and even going above and beyond in, mm -hmm. in going a little too far sometimes. And Lyndon Johnson, not, not weak, weak. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and he got the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and, uh, and Medicaid passed by bullying people. And so it's a total mythology in that sense. But we did lose the string at some point. Mm -hmm. So where, where does it go from these incredibly strong progressives running the country to progressives being outsiders and the Democratic Party being run by the establishment? Yeah. And to your point, the prologue of the book too, Abraham Lincoln and the, the, the radical Republican Party. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that the, the left should very freely embrace, embrace that too. Like all of the great advances have been made by strong, too strong uh, progressives. Um, the the 1980s and Ronald Reagan would be would be my answer to, to that question, and for people who didn't e either who didn't live through that time period or who were not invested in the fortunes of the Democratic Party like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were not like they, they lived through that time period but for different reasons they they both could kind of have cared less what happened to the Democratic establishment in the 1980s, mm -hmm. but what happened to them was like a total uh, evisceration. Their, their entire worldview upended. So, you know, these are people who, from the 1940s on, for, they they oversee the biggest economic expansion in world history. Probably they create the New Deal and the Great Society. They, they you know, they're integral to the women's liberation movement, uh, Black Freedom Struggle, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. These are, their, these are their accomplishments. And then in 1980, a, a C-list actor uh, who, you know, 1978 midterms brought in Newt Gingrich and a bunch of these radical right-wingers. So these are not 
your kind of Rockefeller Republicans who just differ in the margins with your center left Democrats. These are people who are saying that everything Democrats stand for is wrong. And so they're just completely humiliated and annihilated. And, and they and people like Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Chuck Schumer, they, they all live through this, this period. And there's a trauma <laughs> associated with that, that that turned the party from you know a fighting party to one that felt like that internalized the idea that they live in a conservative country. And it's a center right country. And if we want to maintain our hold on some modicum of power, then we're going to have to uh, hide anything liberal and progressive. Get you know, get get behind me here. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, so, and you still see that today. It, they still have that psychic trauma from that moment. Pelosi, when she took over the House in 2007, was the first thing she did, I'm taking impeachment off the table. For Bush, yes. Yeah, for Bush. Yeah. You know, she's been taking impeachment off the table for 12 years. <laughs> and then and you see what happened. It, it institutionalized forever war and torture and black sites. And, and then you know, the, the creep of the executive goes on through the Obama administration because they don't, they don't challenge that. So you see, you, you see it again today that the Pelosi genuinely, remember, Pelosi was saying that if people don't stop talking about abolishing ICE, we're going to blow it in the midterms. People kept talking about abolishing ICE, and they had the biggest midterm victory, you know, since the since the Watergate era. Mm -hmm. um, but nothing, no amount of data, no amount of elections at this point will convince the the Pelosi's and the Hoyers of the world that they they can't they they just can't admit to being liberal. And also, when you've spent thirty years acting the way they've acted, it almost becomes pointless to talk about what you really believe mm -hmm. because you're now 30, 40 years into acting a certain way. That's, yeah. that's you. Yeah. And so the, the two things get very conflated. Yeah, that's yeah. why they uh, amusingly, everyone's almost say, no, no, I'm in favor of single payer. I've been in single payer for single payer right. for 40 years, but not yet, not yet. Right. No, no, we just spent 40 years of you telling me not yet. And you're, I think Pelosi's 78. Are we right. gonna get to it when you're 98, 108, right? And it's not against her age. I like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and they're in their 70s as well. It's about new ideas versus old ideas. Yeah. And you and Pelosi has proven that uh, that weakness has been built into her DNA. Yeah. Now that's verboten to say in Washington because right. there's this cult of uh, Pelosi right. where they think that she's like the greatest legislator ever with almost no accomplishments at all. It's the alternative facts of the mainstream media are in a lot of ways stunning as well. Now, I, 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 I have a slightly different take. I love what you're saying and I think that they're both true and it's not one or the other. I think that there was a big change in 1976 and 78 with the Supreme Court decisions, mm -hmm, yes. Buckley v. Vallejo and Bellani, where they basically legalized bribery and said corporations right. can give unlimited money to politicians. Right. So way before Citizens United and, and then the corporations basically took over the Democratic Party and said, yep. oh, that weakness that you felt after Reagan, absorb it, right. you know, bathe in it, that's what we want and that's what they encouraged. Yeah, and I think these two things definitely go, go hand in hand. So, and, and Tony Quelo, who you know, the, he was this California congressman. He was like a, an Ur Rahm Emanuel. And actually, Rahm Emanuel later worked for him at the DCCC. Mm -hmm. um, so, he, after the 1980 wipeout, he comes to the party and he says, Look, there's this moribund institution called the DCCC. Let me, let me run this thing and I will turn it into a juggernaut by going to corporate America and stocking it with, with corporate cash. He called it a PAC strategy. They now call it fundraising, but mm -hmm. at the time it was an innovation. But it was an innovation that the Republicans already adopted because as you say, the campaign finance laws changed. Republicans were quick to start incorporating more capital and they used that money to pump it into television ads. And actually the, the, the era of big money coincides with the, the rise of television as the, as, the, as the mass media. And as television is fa falling, that, that kind of goes hand in hand with the small dollar revolution because you can reach people in different ways now. Um, and so Quelo says, this is, this is the way we need to respond. We don't need to rethink what our coalition is and what our politics are. We need to match Republicans dollar for dollar, do the 30 second ads, and we need to go uh, to go to corporate America and, and match them. And then because the economy tanked shortly after Reagan was elected, his numbers nosedived and Democrats win this huge midterm wave in 1982. And 
it's a bunch of attaboys for Quelo, and they conclude it must have been the money. They don't look back and say, well, was, there was a recession, there was a Reagan recession, so of course we won. They think, oh, we went to corporate America, we got the money, we cut the ads, we've picked the lock, we're, we're back, baby. And so, and so they were basically in, and when your source of financing is capital, that makes it impossible to come up with a populist progressive coalition because the messaging that you would need to accomplish that runs in direct contradiction to uh, the corporate money that you're getting. So they just had to keep trying to put holes in, in, the, in the dam um, with this corporate money and, and using it in, in ever more clever ways to try to chase the kind of the, the fraying coalition that they had. And what you see is that they just lose and lose and lose and lose. Uh, for two reasons too, and it's very logical. Coelho thought they could match the Republicans dollar for dollar, but they don't. Right. The Republicans always get more money because they're always willing to do more for corporate interests. Right. And, and the second reason is that it, then once you get hooked on it, uh, the, the powerful and the wealthy, they want to fund strong Republicans and weak right. Democrats so that the Republicans can run roughshod and give them all the tax cuts and deregulation that they ever dreamt about. And that the Democrats then are defanged. Right. And so all of their leaders are purposely weak. Now, and it's the, a little bit of the invisible hand of the market. It's not like, you know, the, the, I think the, the funders didn't get together and be like, let's pick Pelosi because she's so right. incredibly weak. The money naturally flowed right. to, because if you were a strong progressive, they say, "Whoa, hey, right. that's, he's upsetting the, he's rocking the boat a little bit too much. He's a, a bridge too far here, so you're not gonna get any money. The one yeah. that's keeping things nice and easy, you're gonna get all the money." The, the purest distillation of that is that the, the Koch brothers are now suggesting that they're gonna start backing up moderate Democrats in primaries if, mm -hmm. if they get challenged by insurgents. You couldn't have a, a, a clearer <laughs> case of how this is gonna unfold. Why do the Koch brothers like the center left Democrats? Yeah, because they will comply. They will do yeah. as they are told. Yeah. And so, and they, unfortunately, they now have a long history of that. What that brings us to 1988 and Jesse Jackson. So now, not a lot of people know uh, that this yeah. part of the story. So what yeah. happened there? And if more people had heard of Harold Washington, the, my subtitle might have been from Harold Washington to AOC. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesse Jackson and Harold Washington worked together on this mayoral campaign. Of this fascinating race in 1983. He's a sitting congressman, African American guy who was backed by Democratic Socialists of America, and he decides that he's going to challenge the Chicago machine. Jesse Jackson gets behind him. Uh, young Lords, a kind of reformed Latino gang in the city, they get they get behind him. They register hundreds of thousands of voters. This is an absolutely extraordinary grassroots effort. Jesse Jackson told me he got uh, he got word that Ted Kennedy. And Walter Mondale were going to come in and endorse Daly, and so he reached out to Kennedy, and he's like, "Look, I've known you for decades. I'm not asking you to endorse Washington, but I'm telling you we're doing something special here. Just stay out of the primary. Let us have a fair fight." Kennedy and Mondale. Mondale was vice president under Carter. Kennedy is Kennedy. Now these are the two most famous liberal. These, and they're not just uh, Democrats. These are liberal. Democrats, mm -hmm. please don't come in here and do this. And they say, look, we're old friends, what can I do? And so they, they, they come in, Kennedy and Mondale endorse Daley in the primary. And that's when Jackson and Washington, you know, they, they fully realize that this is a fight, that, th this is, that this is a fight to the finish. And so uh, Jackson, I think, is quoted me with something like, this kind of liberalism is not liberating. And so they decide that they're going to conceive of themselves as in opposition to this element of the party. They win the primary with this grassroots army. The Democratic machine flips in the general election and endorses the Republican. That's how badly they want to hold on to power. It's, Ryan, it's as if you were writing the book uh, to prove me right. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been saying, no, you don't get it. If Bernie Sanders wins the primary, mm -hmm. moneyed interests are not they don't care about the Democratic Party. Oh, progressives won, great. No, they don't care. That's why Howard Schultz said, mm -hmm. if Biden wins, I won't run. So Biden can right. go ahead and beat Trump. But if Bernie Sanders wins the primary, I'm gonna come in. And basically, he's raising his hand and saying, yeah, I'm incredibly wealthy, so-called Democrat my whole life, now an independent. 
And I'm gonna throw the race in favor of Trump because I'd rather have him win and give me tax cuts than have Bernie Sanders yeah. an actual progressive win. Uh, the Donnie Deutsch on MSNBC the other day said, I'd rather vote for Trump than Bernie Sanders. And the Scarborough had to be like, no, 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 that'll get you fired. We, <laughs> and we don't say that out loud. Just to hint that, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. And so in this case, they, they said the quiet part loud and they literally went and campaigned. This is Rostenkowski, who is Ways and Means chairman and was a colleague of Washington's in Congress, endorses the Republican. And they bring all the machine's energy to bear to try to elect this Republican. The police chief, like a week before the election, Washington had run on he was gonna fire the police chief. Police chief quits in this flamboyant fashion, uh, you know, trying to tell voters that, you know, that if you elect Washington, the crime is gonna run rampant in the city. And Washington wins. You know, he wins, but he wins by like four points in a city that's 90% Democratic, uh, yeah. and then they, and then he has to go to war with the machine to get his agenda uh, enacted. But you're right, they 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 straight up switched, and so then out of that, Washington and Jackson they held a they held a conference to try to get a prominent black leader to run for president. They said we need we need somebody who's going to run as a progressive civil rights champion because this party is not going to change on its own. We're going to have to we're going to have to take it on to do it, and so. Very late in the 1984 season, Jackson runs. Far too late for it to be a serious challenge. It's, it's a more of a messaging campaign. Echoes of 2016, getting in just to spread the message. But he kind of takes off in, in a way that surprised him and everybody else. So then for 88, he gets serious about it. He, has a, he gets in early, gets his campaign apparatus up off the ground. He had registered two million voters in 84, so he's got, yeah. he's got bodies now. Um, mm -hmm. So, kind of reminds me of another situation. Yeah, kinda, <laughs> right? yeah, okay, it's kind of interesting. Of a progressive insurgent yeah. uh, last time around. Now he's got a lot of voters already built in on his side in '88. Yeah. What happens next? Well, one of his few uh, endorsements came from uh, Burlington Mayor Bernard Sanders. <laughs> uh, and another one was uh, the chair of the campaign in Minnesota was uh, Professor Paul Wellstone, ah. who, who two years later. Up, has this huge upset to become a senator. Um, so he stuns everybody, he starts winning primaries and caucuses. And one by one, Joe Biden drops out, plagiarism scandal by um, Al Gore fades. And, you know, this, this is a, they think it's going to be a democratic year, so there's a lot of these stooges in there. And one by one, they're dropping. So now they're in, late into the about 35, 36 primaries and caucuses in, they go into Michigan. Again, interesting parallels. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's Gebhardt, Dukakis, and Jackson left. Jackson pulls off this stunning upset and he wins. He doesn't just blow it out in Detroit, he blows it out in Ann Arbor. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this, this rainbow coalition, as he calls it. He's, he's now in a delegate tie, basically, with Dukakis. Mm -hmm. Gebhardt drops out because he's the hard hat. He's supposed to win Michigan. That's right. You get, That's you, right. You've been yeah. booted. Wisconsin is now a week and a half away. He's polling way ahead in Wisconsin. And he goes to Wisconsin, holds this rally. He says, neoliberalism is doing economic violence to the working classes, white, black, and brown. The only thing, the only way we can fight back is all of us uniting against them. And he's surging and Washington goes into this complete meltdown. The, 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 the public on the record quotes from people, and they're in the book, are just in apocalyptic terms. Mm -hmm. You know, if we nominate Jesse Jackson, the party as we know it is is history, and let's it would have been probably better if it had been. Uh -huh. um, and they 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 go to absolute war with him, and he goes into Wisconsin, and the the huge polling lead evaporates on election day, and he he loses there, and Dukakis kind of rolls into the nomination, and so but there was this week and a half period where. Washington Democrats were confronting the real possibility that Jesse Jackson was gonna be their nominee, running on the idea that this big money Wall Street party that you're trying to build is the wrong way to go. This, we need to do it just with people. Yeah. What he didn't have yet was a way to ch channel that into fundraising, into small dollar fundraising, which, which comes much later. Jerry Brown tried it in 92, with his, remember his 800 number? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that uh -huh. was kind of the forerunner to Bernie Sanders go in New Hampshire saying, I'm going to do my fundraiser. Go to BernieSanders.com. 
Uh, yeah. you know, Jerry Brown would say, call 1 800, whatever. And, and, yeah. and he wouldn't take more than $100. This is back when Jerry Brown was a progressive. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there's so many lessons here, but you got me energized, Ryan, because the one thing I want to scream right now is not this time. Okay. Yeah. And so, and that, so in this small amount of time we have left, you, this parallel to Bernie Sanders today is astounding. Yeah. And will there be an apocalyptic reaction if he actually starts to lead? Right. Uh, absolutely, it's a guarantee, yeah. write it down in stone. All of Washington, Republicans but Democrats more so, will be furious and will try to do everything they can to yeah. stop him. Now, having said that, this time is a little different because the internet does exist, mm -hmm. small dollar donations do exist, Ocasio-Cortez did win, the Justice Democrats mm -hmm. exist, etc. So how do you think the movie ends this time? The, the difference this time is that the establishment is weaker and the, the left is, like you said, stronger and, and more organized. Joe Biden's calling card is his electability and the, the reason that Democratic voters who don't necessarily like him are willing to support him as they think he can beat Trump. That means that if he starts to lose and to fade, then he loses the thing that he has. And so it, it becomes a self-negating phenomenon. So if, if Sanders can win Iowa, then yes, they will start panicking about Sanders, um, but they will start losing faith in Biden. Because what's the point of propping up a loser? Yep. If the only thing he had was that he was a winner. And so then it's, it becomes a question of the, the polls. Uh, you start, the, and you saw a lot of these, but they were ignored in 2016, the head to heads between Sanders and Trump. So if Biden is fading and Sanders beats him in Iowa, beats him in New Hampshire and can get on a roll, uh, and then you start seeing the polls that show well, Sanders actually beats Trump in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Then you could see enough of the party get get behind him and roll into the, the convention. It, it's threading a needle, but that's that's kind of the the, the only path there. And the only uh, upside of the Howard Schultz situation is that most of the people who would vote for him, Deutsch, they're voting in New York or New Jersey or uh, or, or, or Maryland Silicon Valley. or. District Columbia or Silicon Valley. Yeah. They're not voting in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, where it matters. Yeah, Michigan decides elections, right. okay? And who does great in Michigan? Progressives do. Yeah. Or more important and more accurately, non insiders do. Right. If you're an outsider, you have a much better chance in Michigan. So this whole idea of like, oh, Joe Biden's an insider and they love insiders in Michigan. No, they don't. No. Trump won in Michigan, Bernie won in Michigan, yeah. Jesse Jackson won in Michigan, and yeah. we need Michigan. Yeah. So this idea that Joe Biden or the or the establishment Democrats are more electable is nothing but mythology, through and through. It's never been true. It isn't true today. They said, no, no, we can't have Jesse Jackson because Dukakis is more electable. President Dukakis. Yeah. yeah. How did that turn out? Right. Uh, Dukakis got, of course, got annihilated, and uh, and 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 the Democratic Party has been annihilated ever since. Right. Perhaps, just perhaps, we should look at history. And try something different. And it's uh, worth a thought. And and seriously, look, 2020 is the mother load. It's everything. We're at a crossroads. That's why I'm doing this with my hand. Okay, <laughs> we're at a crossroads. And if we win now, we can take over the party, and and actually bring the populism back, progressivism back, and bring strength to the Democratic Party, and get rid of the corruption of the donors. If we lose. God knows how many more years there will be of this tyranny. And so that's the situation. You gotta read the book to have a good sense of what's gonna happen today. It's called We've Got People. It's by Ryan Grimm. It's now available at shoptyt.com. Ryan, thank you for joining us, brother. Oh, really appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. The TYT Plus app is now available on iOS and Android. Download to get more TYT content at tyt.com slash app.